Remain standing, turn with me into the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. Romans, the 12th chapter. And I'm going to start, I know I told you the second verse. Well, let me start with the first verse. And it says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Father, in the name of Jesus, anoint every ear to hear, every mind to perceive, and every heart to believe. And I rebuke and I bind any spirit of the enemy that would hinder people from focusing on what the Spirit has to say to the church. And Lord, as we will delve into this today, I pray that they will have an ear to hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit will say to the church. And I pray they will have eyes to see and they will begin to see the victories that have already been prepared for their future. And God, we thank you for it and we believe you for it. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, you may be seated. It's good to see you. I know that most of you were not here last Sunday because the roads were bad. It was icy. And for those of you that were, you should be given a medal or some commendation for bravery, uh, silver star, something like that. What is that? The Medal of Honor, you know, Purple Heart, whatever. But I thank God for those of you that watched online last week. Pastor Joel Scribner delivered a great word. And um, we're getting ready to launch into something this week that I believe is God is going to supernaturally do some things. And I, I want to say a couple things. Tonight, Pastor Adam will be bringing the word, but him and I are going to team together. And it is going to be a time of impartation, a time of personal ministry. And I don't want you, uh, you know, some of you I know like different speakers at different times. But a lot of times you have to understand when the Holy Ghost begins to orchestrate something, uh, there may be a different actual voice, but the word has become orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. Uh, when I do three and four night meetings, I let people know I have a word that may be broken down into two or three chapters. And so I encourage them. It's not like I'm coming with three or four different messages. I don't believe we're going to have three or four different messages. I believe there's a word that God is going to deposit. And I pray that you're here to read, you might say, each chapter of this week because it's gonna be important because I believe before we hit the first day of February, God is ready to propel you into a season of restoration. I'm not preaching on this just for exercise. I'm preaching on this because I believe it is a word from heaven for you. I believe when we have declared over the last few weeks, as it said, and David recovered all, but the key to this is David recovered all. When you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 30, when David recovered all, it was a result of David strengthening or encouraging himself in the Lord. I believe we're coming into a point in time, ladies and gentlemen, that we have to understand something. It is our responsibility, not our neighbors, to encourage us. We have got to learn how to rise up as mature sons and daughters and learn how to strengthen ourself. 
If you are reliant on the person to the left or to the right of you to strengthen you, then there is something that you've got to grow into that you can be the kind of man and the kind of woman that was like David, that when everything was gone and everyone was against him, he was not on the verge of disaster. He was on the verge of restoration and the wealth of the wicked being released to the righteous. How many are ready for that kind of strength to come upon you even before February is upon us? The Bible, I've talked about restoration, and I've talked about and used the illustration of my dear mentor, Brother Boatwright, and how he took an old, dilapidated 1941-1942 Cadillac that just was horrible. It was just a broken down mess. And what ended up happening, he told me, he said, I'm gonna restore this car. And I looked at him like he was crazy. But he said he was going to do it, so I figured he'd mess around with it and then get rid of it at some point. So I was doing a lot of meetings on the West Coast at the time. And so every time I'd stop in, because I was in and out of Los Angeles quite a bit at that particular year, I would look, and that car was becoming more and more like what we would call showroom quality. And he'd, he'd take me out and he'd say, oh, here's, the, here's the fabric, the original mo, gray mohair fabric that was in the interior. And here's the new tires that were just like it was on the showroom. And for months he worked on this. And like I said, there came a day that I came back to Los Angeles area and he said, get in the car, I want to take you somewhere. Get in my car, I want to take you somewhere. And so I jumped, he had a big old Lincoln Continental and I jumped into the big old Lincoln. He said, not that car this car and so I walked down the little uh, walkway to his garage and he opened up the door and that car looked like it had just been brought home from the showroom there wasn't a scratch on it the paint was perfect the tires were perfect and I'm thinking oh I hope it runs and he came in and he clicked that ignition and that thing began to purr like a kitten he said let's go for a ride And he wheeled that out of his driveway. And the first thing he does, the Santa Ana or Golden State Freeway was about two minutes from his house. And we're jumping on the freeway. I'm thinking, you are out of your mind. He put the pedal to the metal, as they would say, and he was running right with all the brand new cars. It wasn't backfiring. It was purring. I thought, man, this thing's going to break down somewhere. It never broke down. It never belched smoke. It never backfired. You know why? It had been restored. No, 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 I don't, I don't think you're hearing what I'm saying. It had been restored. There was no rust in it. There was no malfunction in the engine. There wasn't a crack. And then he said, listen to this, and he turned the radio on. Now, there was no FM. I, I, I mean, we're talking what, whatever it had, it had. But he flipped that radio on, and he turned the volume up and rolled the windows down. I thought I was rolling with a hippie or something. But the thing was, the radio worked just like it did on the showroom. The windshield wipers worked. The tires were perfect. The engine purred. There was no rust. Nothing was wrong. Nothing was damaged. It glistened in the sunlight. It was midnight and he had it waxed to the hilt and we're rolling down the Santa Ana freeway 70 miles an hour and a 1941 Cadillac that had looked like there was no hope but after he got done and the people that helped him it was like brand new some of you are getting ready to walk into brand new some of you are getting ready to walk into a place you're not going to think like you used to think your body's not going to feel like it has been feeling your attitude is going to begin to shift. Your will is going to be transformed. You are going to understand what it is for God to make all things new. I'll get to my text in a minute. We've got a problem sometimes and part of it has to do with how we think. And a lot of times what the problem is we think on the basis of what I would call historical perspective. We look at our future on the basis of our past. But if you don't get prophetic perspective, 
If you don't get a perspective about your tomorrow that is not in agreement with your yesterday, but it is in agreement with your God said, you will live in a spiritually paralyzed place that each year will be basically a rerun of the previous year. Romans 12, 2 said, and be not conformed to this world. The word conformed simply means this, something that is formed or fashioned after the likeness of something that has already been created. Are you with me? So basically it's a copy. Say it's a copy. It's not an original. Isn't it interesting that there is no two DNA alike? Isn't it interesting no two fingerprints are alike? Isn't it interesting that they can take a sample of your voice and there is no two voice patterns that are exactly alike? Isn't it interesting that in some high security areas what they do is they, uh, I've seen this on James Bond movies and stuff, but you know, they do a thing with the persons, they do an eye scan. And when that person's eye scan appears, um, you know, they, they, it's another level of identification. So things that have to do with our identity, uh, things like our fingerprints, our actual DNA, maybe a scan of our eyes, our voice. Isn't it interesting that they could do that with every one of the hundreds of people that are here today and there would be no two people that would have a match? You know why? Because you weren't created by this world. You were created by God, and even though your actual creation was the biological phenomena of being conceived in your mother's womb, the way God designed you to be designed is that there is nobody exactly like you. Because God doesn't create copies. God creates originals. Now, I don't, I don't think you're listening to anything. I say God doesn't create copies. God creates originals. Some of your problems are is you want everybody to be like you. And the problem is we can't. You're a one and only. You are so magnificent, God threw away the mold when he made you. But don't try to look at me and say, you need to be like me. No, we all just need to be like him. But the issue still boils down to the word says, be not conformed to this world. So in other words, don't allow the spirit of the world to fashion you into something that all you can be is a copy. That's all you'll ever be. And so what is the world trying to get you to do? They try to get you to dress a certain way. They, they try to get you to eat a certain way. Years and years ago, my uncle Orville, who lives out on the West Coast, uh, we, he took me out to dinner, took Gail and I out to dinner, and we sit down at a steak place. And it was when all of a sudden mushrooms begin to be the big craze. And he just looked at the menu and says, what is the big deal about mushrooms? And I thought it was kind of funny, and Uncle O was kind of an eccentric character. But I, I want to ask you a question now. What's the big deal about Brussels sprouts? <laughs> no, I mean, really stop and think about it. The little bitty tiny cabbage. And somebody finally figured out how to fix it to where you didn't want to spit it out. So now wherever you go, it's like, oh man, Brussels sprouts, let's order a side of Brussels sprouts. I spent a majority of my life trying to stay away from Brussels sprouts and now the world is trying to force feed me Brussels sprouts. Get behind me, Satan. Come on. I remember in 1972 when I held my very first revival. Uh, full time. I was in Buffalo, New York. And in Buffalo, New York, there's a place called the Anchor Bar. Just stay spiritual with me now. 
And in the anchor bar was the original buffalo wing. It's where it was created. It, it originated in Buffalo, New York. These are not buffalo wings that come off of buffalo. They are chicken wings that come out of Buffalo, New York. And so the pastor decides I need an authentic buffalo experience. Takes this young 19, 18 year old evangelist to the anchor bar. Now we didn't drink nothing but water, but it was quite a place. But I tasted my first buffalo wings at the originator anchor bar. It was hot. Mild was hot. Sweats running down my brow. And I'm thinking, what is the big deal about these wings that have set my tongue on fire? I must have drank a gallon of water trying to kill the burn, and that was the mild. <laughs> Somebody got moved by buffalo wings. Are you with me? Now we have buffalo wild wings. No, they're just not regular wings, they're wild. Are you following me? You go to Chili's, they have buffalo wings. You go wherever. Anybody else got any buffalo wing places? Tell me. What, your house, oh, your, your house, the Anchor Bar. Okay, uh, are you following me? It's like virtually every restaurant you can think of, all of a sudden, buffalo wings are everywhere. And people think they're from a buffalo. What am I trying to get through to you? The world has a systematic way of taking something and then convincing all of us, whether it's mushrooms, Brussels sprouts, or buffalo wings, and I like buffalo wings. I finally found a temperature I could handle. I like buffalo wings. Put in Louisiana hot sauce, Lord, I'd make you rise up and call your mother-in-law blessed. Not Tabasco, no, Louisiana hot sauce. Lord, that, that was created in heaven. <laughs> well, what I've said is whether it's buffalo wings, whether it's a cheeseburger, whether it's Brussels sprouts, whether it's mushrooms, we have a tendency to be conformed. We have a tendency to say, well, everybody else likes it, so I must like it. But what God's trying to get to us, I didn't call you to be made in the image and the likeness of the system. I called you to be in the image and in the likeness of God. My original creation, I created to have dominion. And when the heavens open up, ladies and gentlemen, something happens to you. You stop being a replica a copy of the world and you start becoming a replica of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God didn't call you to be a victim. He called you to be a victor. He didn't call you to be sick. He called you to be well. He didn't call you to be sad. He called you to be glad. He didn't call you to be under the foot of the enemy. He called you to have dominion. Somebody Somebody needs to give God a praise right now. So he didn't call us to be a copy. He said, but be ye transformed. The word, word transform comes from the Greek word metamorpho, which we get the terminology metamorphosis. So we also understand that one of the primary illustrations of a metamorphosis is a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Amen? Now, I know you all know this, but I need the practice. A caterpillar lives a certain length of time, and then at a certain length of time, there is something in the forces of nature that causes the caterpillar to stop functioning as he has been functioning and allow this phenomena called a cocoon to begin to envelop the caterpillar. Now, we call the process a metamorphosis because the caterpillar, a butterfly is not a caterpillar with wings. A butterfly is a new creation. 
because the caterpillar actually completely dissolves in the cocoon. And so all that made the caterpillar the caterpillar dissolves into some form of a liquid or whatever it may be. And then in the cocoon, it's like a recreation. Now, this is what a metamorphosis is. And so after a period of time, all resemblance to a caterpillar has disappeared. And that which we all acknowledge is one of the most beautiful creations is a butterfly, which there are no two butterfly wings that are alike. because there's been a metamorphosis. So the metamorphosis occurs and then the butterfly begins to violently fight its way out of the cocoon. So the word says, you're not called to be a copy, but be ye transformed or experience a metamorphosis or a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, a total rebirth. Hello. Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. A total rebirth, because what happens, the cocoon becomes the butterfly's womb. And so now the old of the caterpillar is in the womb of the cocoon and it is being recreated into not another caterpillar, but into a new creature. So be not a copy, but experience a metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind. Mm. Now the word renewing I've said all this to get to here. Sure wish you could say it faster. <laughs> be you not conformed to this or be you transformed by the renewing. The word renew means to make new, to renovate, to restore. Now, by what standard does God bring restoration to your thinking? Well, he says things like in the book of Philippians, let this mind be in you which is in Christ. The Bible tells us to put on the helmet of salvation. So basically you cover your thinking with the saved and delivered principles of God. The Bible says now we have the mind of Christ. Are you with me? I don't think God is just looking to increase your IQ. I believe God is looking to give you a new mind, a new way of thinking, a new way of analyzing information to where your thoughts, which result in your actions, are in a place where he says his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So if I am not to be a copy of this world, so I'm down here as a copy of the world, but now I experience a metamorphosis. So old is passed away. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. I have become born again in the womb of my spiritual cocoon. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. So there is a metamorphosis that has transacted. And in the process of that metamorphosis, I get born again. And when I get born again, I don't have an improved mind because I'm not who I was. I have a new mind. Oh, this is going to sink in about three o'clock and some of you are going to shout. I don't have an improved mind. I have a new mind. And that word renewed means to make new, to renovate, but in essence to restore. But if it's restored, God is looking not at the mind 
that came from the flesh. Romans 8, 6 says, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So stop and think about this. If all of a sudden the carnal mind is shut down and the spiritual mind is activated, what's the result? Restoration. Life comes to you. Peace comes to you. Joy comes to you. Creative ideas come to you. Prosperity is coming to you. Actions uh, that your steps, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. You don't have weird movements and actions. You're not making ignorant decisions. Our, what has happened? There has been a restoration of your mind. And God is saying, I'm not talking about the old way you used to think. I am talking about the way I always intended you to think. The prototype now is not your mother or your father or your grandparents or your nationality. The, the, the gold standard now is let this mind be in me which is in Christ. God, excuse me, some of you go get mad. God doesn't care if you're red, yellow, black, or white. He doesn't care if you're American, Canadian, Mexican, Asian, uh, 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 Native American, if you're German, if you're English, if you're French, if you came from Africa, if you came from the Middle East, God doesn't care about any of that because when he got done working with you, you're not who you were. You are a new creation. And as a new creation, you have a new mind and you have a new way of thinking. Okay. Now, Restoration is activated by being born again. Spiritual thinking is a result of being born again, which is fed by sight and hearing. You with me? Okay, so I have a new mind. And now my new mind should be causing me to operate in a new way. You hanging? This is, there's a difference between just simply saying I'm forgiven and truly walking into a place of regeneration. So now you have a spiritual mind but a mind has never been designed to be dormant. It's designed to be fed information and then give commands. Would you agree with that? God didn't create your mind. Now, now men, we have a problem with this. Because men can go flatline. Gentlemen, would you not agree there has never been a time that you asked your wife what she was thinking about that she did not give you an answer? That is why you never asked that question. Because you, you do not know what quadrant of the brain was in action that had the dominance of her attention when you asked that question. But gentlemen, can you not agree that there have been many times throughout your life and your marriage that your wife has asked you what you were thinking about and you could honestly, sincerely, without fear of the judgment of God, of being a liar, could honestly say nothing. <laughs> do I have a witness? No, do I have any male witnesses in the house? Come on, gentlemen, say it with me. Nothing. Nothing. And were you being truthful? Yeah. Just flatlined. <laughs> and I'm not going to say what your wife says to you or my wife says to me, but gentlemen, in all honesty, they are completely justified in their feelings. But God did not design your male or female mind to be dormant. He designed your mind to give commands and he designed your mind 
to be an intaker of information. The problem we get into, we are in the information society, but most of the information that is being spewed out over the internet, television, radio, printed materials is extremely toxic and compromised. It is not submitted in any way, shape, or form to the laws or to the purposes of God. So what begins to happen? We have a spiritual mind that we are feeding carnal information. Hold on to your hats now. Which results in lukewarm commands. No, you didn't hear me. I said we have a spiritual mind receiving carnal information which results in lukewarm commands. That's why the apostle said, do you have an ear? He that hath an ear, let him hear. The word declared that our eyes be anointed with an eye salve that we can see. We are seeing many times what the enemy wants us to to see. We are hearing what the enemy wants us to hear. You cannot stop the noise. You cannot stop what is being produced before your eyes. But you can rise up in the spirit and you can begin to understand something. I am a new creation and I cannot feed my brain this poison. I have to feed my brain that which comes from heaven that my mind is fed from the spirit and will give red hot spiritual commands Matthew 13 16 says but blessed are your eyes for they see blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear God's getting ready to restore our hearing In Proverbs, the 20th chapter, the 12th verse says, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made both of them. That's just not talking about your natural ear and your natural eye. It's talking about the ability to see spiritually and to hear spiritually. As I already quoted, Revelation 3.13, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, saith. So God talks. There is a spiritual realm that is not seen by the carnal eye, but it is seen by the spiritual eye. Revelation 3, 18, and anoint thine eyes with an eye salve that thou mayest see. The eyes and the ears are referenced together consistently in Scripture when it comes to being spiritually perceptive. So, you know, we have, we, we've got to start making some determinations. If you want to get healthier, how many would agree you're going to probably have to make some dietary modifications? Uh, I, I know, but you know, Krispy Kremes are wonderful, but they're not exactly the healthiest thing to eat. I don't know about you, but there isn't anything better than a Five Guys burger. And if you really want to make it good, put some Louisiana hot sauce on it. (laughs) But it's really not the healthiest thing. If you want to be healthy in your diet, you have to listen to your wife. And your wife will always say, I need a salad. Why does that word almost sound like profanity? (laughs) It's like she looks at you and says, we need a salad. It's not like, you know, sweetheart, We need to enjoy the evening with a wonderful salad. No, it's, we need a salad. (laughs) Because it's profanity to her too. Whether she wants to admit it or not, she'd like a great big double cheeseburger with a huge side order of fries and the most unhealthy ketchup and mustard that's on the market. And then we come through the prayer line and pray God will open up our arteries. 
because we can't understand why we're facing open heart surgery. But see, we have this spiritual mind and the same way we determine what we put into our natural mouth to consume, we have the power to make decisions. We have the power to stay in a place with God that we can see what the Spirit is prepared and we can hear the voice of the Holy Ghost and what begins to happen. The voice of God overrides the voice of the enemy. God can talk louder than the devil. But isn't it interesting where your ears are? They're right there by your brain. Your eyes are right there by your brain. And in the, in the realms we're talking about here, your eyes and your ears spiritually are the direct information connectors to your brain, which determines what you see and what you hear has an impact upon a restored mind. Still here? Go to the 10th chapter of Romans. And I'm going to start with the 8th verse. Very familiar segment of Scripture, powerful segment of Scripture. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scriptures say, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call unto him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Okay, let's stop there for just a second. So now, faith has to get activated. You hear me? Faith has to get activated. So something has to hit us that stops us in movement of conformity and activates a metamorphosis of transformation which results in a renewed mind, a restored mind, a mind that thinks and gives commands that are spiritual and not carnal. So how does it start? It starts with a preacher because the preacher brings a word that activates or fertilizes faith. Okay, biologically, a woman can have a fertile egg, but if there is not a seed that comes into agreement with that, there is no life created. Everybody got me? Okay. Now, unto every man, I read it earlier, unto every man is given a measure of faith. So there is faith in every atheist. Come on. There is faith in every atheist. But that egg, let's say, of faith does not come to life without the seed of the word. Now, stay with me on this. Now, I grew up in church. Right. Because it said, how can they preach except they be sent? Now, we got a whole generation of motivational speakers, but they don't have the power of life in what they're saying. They're not potent. And so when they speak... It does not fertilize the egg of faith. But when somebody that is anointed or is spiritually potent, they fertilize the egg of faith. So what happens? Faith cometh by hearing. Now, 
I know y'all get restless because you're part of this attention deficit generation. <laughs> but I, I really need you to hang in here with me on this because I'm getting ready to rattle your world and cause you to understand how great you really are in God. So what begins to happen? It all starts with this. God stops the conformity to the world. Then when he stops the conformity of the world, it is happening because of a metamorphosis that we are in the womb of the power of the Holy Spirit that is causing us to become a new creation. And as we are birthed out of the spiritual womb, now we have been transformed by a restored spiritual mind. This process starts through the seed of the faith word being preached from a messenger that is anointed. And when that messenger is anointed, it connects with the measure, my God, the measure of faith that is on the inside of you. And as it connects with the measure of faith on the inside of you, life begins to happen that activates what we call a born again experience, which activates a, a restored mind. Now you gotta hang in here with me. I know you just everybody likes it easy now. And how shall they call on him whom they have not believed in? How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of, the, uh, of them that preach the gospel. That doesn't mean that the man of God just had a mani-pedi. That statement means how on time, how perfectly on time are the steps of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes when you hear and the hearing is unstopped by the power of the word that is delivered into your life. Now, just stay with me on this. So the first faith by hearing that happens is through an anointed vessel. So faith is activated. And then we read in Proverbs 23, 7. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Stay with me now. I've heard it. Faith is alive. It's not a dormant egg. It has been fertilized by the power of the word of God. And now my heart has been regenerated. And as I think in my heart, so am I. Mm. All right, all right. Now, and then you go to Matthew, back to Matthew, uh, into Matthew 12, 34. Then it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So now, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So my heart's been regenerated. So how do I think? I think like a regenerated man. Don't think like a caterpillar anymore because I'm not a caterpillar anymore. I'm a butterfly. I, I, I mount up with wings as of an eagle. I run and I'm not weary. I walk and I'm not faint. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If God be for me, no power can stand against me. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? That's who, mm, my God, that's who I am right now. Then it goes on that it says this, uh, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then in Proverbs it said, and life and death and life are in the power of the tongue. Oh, it's cynical. So now we get back to this faith cometh by hearing part. Preacher speaks. Faith is activated. Faith creates regeneration. Regeneration creates a new identity. New identity causes a new confession. Now what's coming out of your mouth? What's coming out of your mouth is life. What's coming out of your mouth is words of faith. What's coming out of your mouth is the declaration of the word of God. You don't just start asking for things. You start declaring things. You don't just start saying, oh God, help me out. No, I believe that whatsoever I bind is bound and whatsoever I loose is loosed. God is more than just somebody waiting on you to 
asking for something. Rise up and speak life. Rise up and speak things into existence. Rise up and declare what thus saith the Lord. You know what starts happening? You start opening the heavens when you do that. No, I'm not swimming on the surface today. We're going a little bit deeper in this thing. What you have to understand now, David encouraged himself in the Lord. How did he do it? He had to talk to himself. Some of you don't know how to talk to yourself. I'm ugly. Well, that may be the case. You don't have to talk about it. (laughs) How do you talk to yourself? Is it all doom and despair and misery on end? Is it all a negative confession? It is all the world's coming it in. Oh, woe is me. I didn't run through the troop and leap over a wall. The troop stomped me and the wall fell on me. Oh, we used to sing, I'm up on the mountain and won't come down. Now you're saying I'm down in the valley and I can't get out. We sing the old song, he is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. And now we sing, I'm so lonesome. I could cry here that lonesome wind. So sing. I'm so lonesome, I could cry. <laughs> My D I V O R C E. It's final today. <laughs> How do you talk to yourself? No, is it all, oh, I feel so bad. Oh, my head hurts. Lord, I can see why healing evangelists stay in business. Lord, everybody's sick in the church. My head hurts. My arches are falling. My kidneys are floating. My eyeballs are crossed. I got post-nasal drip and bronchial congestion. Oh, my stomach's just a flip-flopping. My heart's just a fluttering. Lord, have mercy. I could, uh, uh, I was in, in Dallas, Texas, preaching back in the early 1970s. And a woman came up to me and she said, I need healing. And that was back before I realized it's not a good question to ask people what they need healing of. (laughs) Oh, brother, my head hurts. Oh, Father God, that's not all. (laughs) And this year, I've lost 50% of my hearing. And this one, they tell me, is ruptured. And I can't breathe out of this side of my nose. And this side won't stop dripping. And they tell me I'm going to have to have cataract surgery. My throat hurts all the time. My teeth are falling out. Now, we haven't got to the neck yet, baby. (laughs) And my neck, it just hurts. I, I just can't hardly turn it much past this and it just didn't do the pain just shoots up and down my back and it goes into my hips and you know I, once one day I walk like this and then the next day I walk like this all right let's pray no I'm not done yet All my joints are inflamed, my knees and my elbows and my ankles are swollen. It's a miracle I can even say because I'm I'm lightheaded right now. And then she looked at me and she said, I bet you've never seen anybody sick as me. And she got the biggest grin on her face. I said, ma'am, I'm young, and I, I got to agree. I've never seen anybody as messed up as you. <laughs> God, in Jesus' name. Did she get a miracle? No. She had what she wanted. 
because she wanted attention more than she wanted health. She wanted people to feel sorry for her more than she wanted to run through a troop and leap over a wall. Say, what are you getting at? What I'm trying to get at is you have the power to restore and strengthen yourself. And when you look at the mirror and you say, this is what I need, you have the power. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And as you think in your heart, that's who you are. And out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So you rise up in the morning and you don't get up and say, I wonder what horrible thing's gonna happen today. No, you get up and say, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. And the enemy may come at me, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and my God will heal all my diseases and my mind will be the mind of Christ I will have the wisdom of God and you haven't even made it to the shower yet I'm not trying to belittle anybody that's struggling physically or anybody that's struggling emotionally or mentally. I make some exaggerated, well, that story about that woman wasn't exaggerated, but I I, I will put some emphasis on it because I want your attention. Somewhere, you've got to make up your mind. Am I going to lay in the cave of darkness or am I going to take up my bed and walk? Am I going to lay down and say, my men are against me. My house has been burnt down. I've lost everything that I have. Or are you going to rise up and encourage yourself? Because when you encourage yourself, you start moving toward restoration. Showroom quality. Not a brain that's backfiring. But it's on all eight cylinders, or 12, or four, or six, whichever the mechanical case may be. But it's functioning at an optimum level that is in agreement with the mind of the Spirit. Say, I want restoration, Pastor. I want a restoration of years. And we're going to have to start listening for something besides the voice of doom, despair, and death. We've got to start looking and we've got to see more than the prophet's servant saw in 2 Kings, the sixth chapter. When he looked out there and all he saw was the enemy. And the prophet said, Lord, open his eyes that he can see. Do you realize what God wants to do for you this week, starting right now, tonight, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? He wants to open your eyes. You you know what he wants to do? He wants to take the deafness out of your ears. Why do you keep hearing things that people said to you 20 years ago? God has something to speak to you today. Why is it that all we see is the problem? Many are the tests. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Well, what did God say? said, I will deliver you out of them all. And I've used this analogy before when they're training people with martial arts. One of the things they do, at least I hear they do it in karate, is they teach the person if they're going to hit a board, they have to think past the board. So come here, Duke. I'm going to put my fist right through your head. So what's going to happen? So, so Duke is a big board. But if all I'm thinking about is making contact here, there's not going to be that much impact. But when my contact site is here, then the power of when I throw my punch is directed here, not here. Are you following me? And that's what gives that hit the intensity that is different than you just look at Okay, here's where it's at. Well, God, thank you, Duke. I don't want to harm you because Vicky didn't, didn't pay the insurance policy this month. So. <laughs> so, so what happens? We get the barrier 
and all we see is the barrier. And God's saying, you got to see what I got over here. And see, sometimes we're not seeing past the wall. We're not seeing past the Goliath. We're not seeing past the mountain. All we're seeing is the barrier. And you know something? In your walk with God and in my walk with God and in our work together in the things of the kingdom, there's always going to be something. But you just got to get to a point when you look at it. And it's kind of like, who art thou? O thou mountain that would stand before me. Be thou made a plain. And so, oh my, there's a mountain. No. Uh, what? Are you crazy, devil? Have you lost your mind? Are you a fool? Every time you've done this before, I just moved you out of the way. And today's no different than yesterday, except I'm more anointed today because I've been encouraging myself consistently. And now my spiritual muscles are bigger than they've ever been. I, I hope you brought a legion with you. But really, to be honest, I think I got the power to handle a legion. So what's happening? Faith comes by hearing. It changes who you are. It changes what comes out of your mouth. And then faith is strengthened by hearing, which continues to reinforce who you are, which continues to perfect what comes out of your mouth, which strengthens you more, which reinforces you to another level of I am who God says I am. And then your confession becomes more powerful and your faith becomes greater. And all of a sudden, a measure of faith becomes the faith of God. Amen. And when you have the faith of God, when you have the faith of God, all things are possible. You still here? I see you. I just want to make sure you're here. Here's, what, here's what's getting ready to happen. Because restoration is a result. Restoration is a result of something. It's a strengthening of yourself in the Lord, which is really comes through the restoring of your mind. Go with me to Amos, the ninth chapter in the 13th verse. It says in the King James, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountain shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall melt. I'd like to read it to you out of another translation. The days are coming, says the Lord, when grain will grow faster than it can be harvested, and grapes will grow faster than wine can be made. Now, David strengthened himself in the Lord. He pursued, he overtook, he recovered all, and everything was restored, but something also interesting happened. All that the devil's crew had stolen became David's spoil. And David became, in a matter of hours, now I want you to get this, in a matter of hours, David was more prosperous than he had ever been in his entire life. They are crying over what they lost at Ziglag. And in a matter of hours, every one of his men and him were more prosperous than they had ever been in their life. So what was happening? The days are coming, saith the Lord, when grain will grow faster than it can be harvested and grapes will grow faster than wine can be made. Because we are always putting things on our natural timetables. But to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So what does God start doing? He starts saying this. Listen, I'm going to start doing some things. And before you even finish reaping the harvest of this one thing, the harvest of the next thing has been loosed. Before you get finished fermenting the wine, agricultural society, agricultural analogies, before you get done fermenting this harvest, another harvest will be there that you're going to have to start fermenting. Oh, yes, it's going to create some work, but it's going to be fun because you're going to look, okay, I just got this harvest and, and the check's in the mail and everything's coming together, but this harvest is coming. It's like one thing. 
thing is just overlapping the other. You say, how can God restore the years? That's how God restores the years. Because God starts doing in a matter of days what should have taken a matter of months. Or he starts doing in a matter of months what should have happened in a matter of years. And then you're starting to look and say, my Lord, I made more in the first quarter of this year than I made all last year. Why? Because the grain was coming in so fast that while you're finishing up rejoicing in the one harvest, the next harvest was coming. You say, oh, pastor, that can't happen. Why can't it happen? God said it can happen. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ. Why can't God add 100,000 to you instead of 10,000? Why can't God open the windows, open the windows, open the windows of heaven and create an open heaven over your life that when you look at it, you begin to say it's impossible that this has happened, but it happened anyway. My house was appraised for this much, but how did this happen? I sold it for this much. And so you get done signing one contract and another one's being put in front of you. You get done with one raise and they're giving you another. You just deposit the one bonus and there's another one on the way. I don't think anybody wants to listen to this, but God said, I'm going to restore the years. And that's how he does it. That's how he does it. He just starts picking up the pace. It's only 24 hours in a day. Well, good. If there's only 24 hours in a day and you be getting $20 an hour, then maybe it's time you get $60 an hour. God has ways of releasing blessing into your life, but it begins with not being conformed. It begins with the renewal of your mind. And as your mind is renewed, you think about your money different. You have wisdom with your resources. You think about your marriage different. You think about your family different. And you're thinking with the mind of the spirit and the wisdom of God. And I don't know about you, but 2018 is my year to recover it all. If you believe it, give God a shout. No, I said if you believe it, give God a shout. An open heaven. An open heaven. An open heaven. Stand to your feet all over the house. You need to stretch for a little bit. I know I preached. I took, well, I didn't preach last week, so I got another hour. <laughs> now I want you to stand up and stretch for just a second. I'd like you for the next 30 seconds, I just wish you'd throw your hands up. All of you up in the balcony, throw your hands up toward heaven. I mean, I want you to start praising God that this is your year of restoration. I want you to start believing God right now that the Lord of creation is going to do miraculous and supernatural things. Come on, come on, come on. I want you, if you're a business owner, I want you to start praising God right now. We're still in the first month of the year. I want you to start praising God that this year will be the greatest year your company has ever had. If you're in a, you work for somebody, I declare the biggest bonuses you've ever gotten, the most hourly compensation, a, a readjustment to your contract, whatever it might be. If you've got property to sell, I'm declaring in the name of Jesus that you're not going to get appraised value, you're going to get more than appraised value. I declare your retirement accounts are going to begin to go up. Your investments are going to begin to increase. I declare your mind is going to be a receptor for God-given prosperous ideas, for thoughts to how to heal your home, your marriage, your family. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ. Uh, come on, open your mouths up. Start thanking him. Start thanking him. Start thanking him. Start thanking him. Start, thanking him. Uh, start praising Start believing God. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ. Let the wisdom of God be upon you. I declare saved, delivered, restored thinking in the name of Jesus. Now give God a shout of victory. Hallelujah. All right. Now, I want, you, I want you to hear me. Anybody can shout after it manifests. But faith cometh by hearing. 
Now I want you to talk to yourself for just a second. I know we've been praising, but I want you to talk to yourself. Ladies, do, you, do any of you women have mirrors in your purses? Get them out. You got a compact, a mirror in your purse. Get it out, quick, quick, quick. And I don't want you messing with your makeup or anything. Get a mirror out. Gray, get your mirror out. Yeah. And if any of you men have mirrors, do not get them out. Please. I just can't bear that right now. We got too much strangeness going on in the world. All you ladies, get your mirrors out. And if you got a mirror, just, just look at it. Just look at yourself. I, and you put your husband in there with you. He's a little bit frightening looking. But just uh, if you've got a mirror for a family, just look at yourself. And I want you to speak to yourself. I want it to reflect right off that mirror. I want it to reflect right off that mirror. And I want you to say, this is my year. Oh, come on. Say it with some authority. This is my year of restoration. Restoration of health. Restoration of finance. Restoration of peace and joy. This is my year. I will recover all. Oh, that sounded pretty good, but say it again. I will recover all. One more time. I will recover all. Sing it, Alex. Alex.